and we expect to go about 90 minutes total. Um, our agenda tonight is there will be a budget overview uh, done by um, Peter Hayes, the Town Council Finance Chair, and Jody Shea, the School Board Finance Chair, and then we'll just get right to the questions. So again, I thank you for coming out tonight, and uh, with that, I will cede the floor to uh, Peter Hayes and Jody Shea. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Peter and I are just going to give you a basic overview of where we have started um, probably three to four weeks ago and the process that has happened over the last um, few weeks and right up until today we have some, some new information, so breaking news, hold on to your hats. Um, and as we go through, we're gonna, it's going to be more casual than it has in the past. We feel like this env environment is a more casual environment, so it's going to be a lot of a conversation between Peter and I and, and things that we've discussed um, in our joint finance committee meetings um, along the way. So with that, I think, I think a good starting point was where do we really start this budget process? As Jody just talked about, we started this several weeks ago. And as you can see here, what we, what we have shown is what the original proposed budget was that we took a look at on the first reads. And the net budget came in at about $64.8 million was the request. And last year we took a look at this, and, and one of the real challenges we have every year is trying to figure out when we come up with what we need for money to raise through the tax rate, what is going to be the assessed property values? And in the past, we've always used a very, very conservative sort of estimate. So what we decided to do last year, actually under the suggestion all the work that a fellow council member, Will Rowan, I think who is in the audience, Will, <laughs> put a lot of time into coming up with a formula that maybe could, could maybe come up with a more accurate projection. So what we have is sort of a range of numbers that this tax, the, the requested tax amount can, can be. You see here what the different values are. There's a very conservative sort of estimate, a mid-range estimate, and then the most optimistic um, estimate. It's really based on a 10-year compound, looking at a 10-year compound rate of how much the real estate values have gone up. It's about 1.3%. The lowest range of the estimate is about half of that. The highest range is 150% is more. So given that, that puts us in a quarter of a tax increase from the original request of somewhere between 5.7% percent increase to 7.1 percent. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but that was sort of our starting point. So with that, um, what we wanted to talk a little bit about are what are some of the budget drivers that we're looking at this year that we're dealing with that drove some of those numbers we looked at originally. On the, on the municipal side, the health plans that, are, that the employees, town employees have really are different between the school department and the municipal side. On the municipal side this year, We've had very favorable health care rate increases in the past several years. Our experience has caught up with us, and this year the rate increase we got for health care was about 15 percent. We've been averaging much less than that. So that is something that's really driving some of the numbers on the municipal side of the budget. And then for, for the school side, contractual obligations are obviously always going to be one of our major drivers. And we're not going to get into the details of, of all the contracts on the school side, but it, it has been brought up in some of the questions that will be answered here tonight. So um, I don't know if Kevin mentioned it, but the, all of the questions will be posted along with the answers um, after this event, probably in the next few days. So um, we will answer questions about the contract um, later tonight, but they'll also be posted online. And then um, state revenues is obviously another major budget driver for us. This year the um, school department or the town of Scarborough is slated to lose $1.4 million in state funding. And so that is a 40% reduction over what we received last year in state funding. And it creates um, what is called a minimum receiver. So we have hit that mark. And <laughs> Am I supposed to be going down? All right. So what is um, minimum receivership and what does it mean for us and what does it mean going forward? Minimum receiver is, there's a state statute that requires all communities receive a minimum amount of GPA funding, general purpose aid funding. And so that is either calculated through per pupil costs or a percentage of your special education expenses. And so in this year's um, FY18, 
subsidy, we were slated to get $1.4 million. Well, that didn't meet the minimum receiver statute, and so with that in effect, we then will now get the $2.1 million that you've heard about. That is 33% of our special education expenses from 2016. That's how that's calculated. So what does that mean going forward? It pretty much means that we now can estimate better what we will get. The volatility of state funding is sort of out of the picture. We're now minimum receivers. We know how it's calculated, and we can plan accordingly. So state subsidy over time. This chart for me sort of sums it all up pretty basically. When state subsidy has been decreasing over the last nine years, you can see how that affects the Scarborough tax rate. So Scarborough state subsidy back in 2009 was $7 million, and this year the 2018 projection is, again, the $2.1 million. That's a 70% reduction in state funding over the last nine years. In FY17, which we are currently in, 7.8% of the approved budget for Scarborough schools was funded by the state. And if we continue at the $2.1 million, which, again, we won't know that until after the budget vote, that's a 4.5%. The state will be funding 4.5% of our proposed budget. So with limited other non-tax revenues, the loss of state subsidy shifts the cost of education to the taxpayers. And, again, this just kind of graphically shows it really takes a look at the orange line that you're looking at is sort of what's been happening to the municipal budget over time since 2009. The blue bar is really the school budget, and we just talked about some of the influences of why that school budget has been increasing. For every dollar we lose in state revenue, we're having to pick that dollar up from the tax base. And the top line represents the combined budgets, and this is what you're looking at, and this has sort of been our history. But I think to put that in context, what we'd really like to look at, and it's been really important to both in the past couple of years, it's become really important for both the town council and the board of education to really take a look at our taxes and really say we need to find a way that we can get to a sort of sustainable and predictable tax increase so everybody can know what to expect. And all this chart takes a look at, the blue bar represents what the mill rate in taxes has been, but the bar I want you to look at is sort of the yellow peaks and valleys, or orange, I guess, on that screen. And what that really is is the percentage increase in the tax rate over time. So if you look back in time, the tax rates have kind of bounced all over the place. But if you look from about 2015 forward, the average tax increase in the last three years has been 2.53%. And sort of our goal and what we've talked about is really trying to have a predictable and sustainable tax rate of at or around 3%. So in the last couple of years, we've done a better job of really trying to manage that that predictable tax rate, that's still something we're talking about. That will be part of our conversation tonight. But I just thought it was a great context to kind of look at where we've been to where we're trying to go. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as we, as we move forward. So the other thing we've talked about, we talked a little bit about where we started from. We talked a little bit about what are some of the drivers. And our work is still continuing. We're not done. As, as, as Kevin sort of teed up earlier, we still have several weeks of this process to, to go through and move forward. The, the Town Council Finance Committee is still looking at some of the budget requests. But some of the things we're looking at is, okay, we showed you where we are. We, we have communicated to you. We're trying to get closer to the 3% tax increase we've talked about. Some other things that we're looking at and talking about right now is, how do we use fund balances? We really think that we have, in this budget that you've seen, we've already used a pretty healthy amount of fund balance. We've used about $2.1 million to roll forward. We really think that that's an appropriate level. We, as we look forward, we know next year is going to be a tough budget year, too, because of what we just talked about with, with a loss of state funding. We really think we need to kind of keep some of that reserve for next year to help smooth out that tax increase we're talking about. We think we're at, at, a, at, a, at the right place right now, but we will continue to talk about that. 
The other thing that, that both the Board of Education and the municipal side has committed to, they're going to start looking and try to curtail any unnecessary spending um, starting now and rolling it forward so that we can really try to build those reserves going forward. Second thing we're starting to talk about, and again, we're really at this, this critical point, and we really need some input from our community. We think we're sort of at the point where the, these numbers are numbers. Anything that we reduce from here, we'll, we'll show you where we arrived at, but we start thinking about impacting service levels that we're delivering to the town, and that's a real conversation that we need to have and will have, and there's choices for the communities on, on what they want to pay for in services, but we really think we're closing in on at this point, further reductions from where we're going to show you um, may have some consequences and some trade-offs on services and other things. So that's a little bit of where we are in that. The other piece we're looking at is taking a look at some of the capital investments. Capital investments don't hit the budget this year. They, it's money that we spend but will be in debt service in future years. So we're taking a look at what can we do with that, what can we change, are those capital investments, is now the right time to be making them? We're also taking a look at, we historically have had some things that we've put into capital expenses that are more operational, and we've tried to start to move those back into our operational budgets. We did that this year, but we're looking at some of the timings of those things. So those things are continuing conversations. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about food service or? Yeah, and I, I think you've covered it with the fact that we are, are fully funding food service um, for the first time. It, we typically sort of come back to that at the end and, and cover the cost through fund balance. Um, but food nutrition, the nutrition um, line item is fully funded this year. And so again, it, these are considerations that we have to sort of continue to talk about and, and decide is this the year that we do that or is this the year do we hold off and, and wait. So always in motion. And then the last item is the state budget implications. This year, because again, we won't know where the state budget ends, where they end up before we vote. And so we have been allowed um, to add a question to the ballot in June, June 13th, Town Hall 7 to 8, uh, voting. So it will ask, um, one, if you approve the school budget, and then two, uh, the joint finance committees have agreed that we feel, we recommend, we feel that it's important to sort of give back part of any excess funds that we get after the budget vote to help reduce the tax rate. So 50% um, of any money over, any funds over that 2.1 million, 50% of that will go to reducing the tax rate this year and then 50% will go into fund balance. Typically what happens is if we um, pass the budget and then the state passes their budget, that money, any, any excess funds automatically goes into fund balance for future years. But with this second question, it allows us to get authority from you, the voters, to use part of that this year to help reduce the tax rate. And again, this is a joint recommendation by the joint finance committees of the Board of Education and the Town Council. These need to go back and be approved by our respective bodies, but it's our recommendation to do that. We thought we'd share that with you this evening. So given that, sort of where we are, so we talked about where we started from. We talked about this has been a work in progress. There, you know, there's sort of weekly meetings. We've been, we've been working the numbers for a while. This is sort of a summary of where we are as of today. These numbers are again are moving as, as we look into some of these things. So again, the first reading, there was a proposed budget request of 64.8 million. Since that point in time, um, we've identified about 1.5 million dollars of adjustments that we can make to the budget. We will go into a little more detail about what these things are as the evening progresses. But that then brings, as it stands right now today, that brings the request down to about 63.3 million, which brings that budget request for, for the tax increase to somewhere between 3.25 and 4.8 percent. And again, we started at the 5.8 to 7. So it's, it, it, it's a change. It's moving in the right direction. Um, if you take that mid-range evaluation, which we think is sort of the, the, the middle of the road, um, that's about a 4% budget increase, but we're still working those numbers, and, but that's, that's sort of where we are as of this evening. And I think it's important to, to note with this slide, this is, these are brand new numbers. This has not been vetted through the school board finance committee, it has not been vetted through the town council finance committee. These are numbers as of this afternoon. So. Um, yeah, these, are, these are the committee's this is, recommendations. This is a recommendation. So, 
So with that, um, what we wanted to talk a little bit, and we're kind of closing in on our piece, so we'll turn it back to Kevin. Uh, but some other conversations we've had, and, and actually it really will tie into kind of the theme tonight, and looking at the questions we did get from a lot of the public, there's lots of questions about, we've, we've talked a lot about the town of Scarborough and we're growing and some of the needs. There's talk about public safety building. There's some talk of the library wants an expansion. There's some talk about investments in our schools. But we really realize it's important to do is this, the joint finance committees only meet, have traditionally met just around the budget issues. We really think that it, going forward, it's really important that we continue to meet throughout the year to start jointly working on some of these issues. So again, we have made a commitment um, that we will continue some of this work beyond the budget season to really start addressing some of the longer range strategic issues as we talk. Again, to try to get to this predictable and sustainable tax increase. Um, and I, I think there's going to be other things that are facing us. There's, you know, again, there's going to be, there's still the ripple effect of the shortfalls from school funding. Next year we know there's going to be um, an impact for us, so that will be a pressure point for us that we need to talk about. And again, we really are trying to change the whole community engagement and dialogue between how do we make this a community issue, a community budget, um, and really want to kind of continue that conversation around and get all of your, everyone's input into what we want to do as a community. So those are some of the things that we're going to continue to work on even as this budget cycle kind of closes out. So I think with that, what are the next steps in the budget process? And I think Kevin intends to talk a little bit about this. We'll probably put this slide back up, but this is just a real quick summary. Yeah, as I said earlier, we said earlier, this is kind of a work in progress. There's still several steps still left in the process. Um, as I had said, I'll talk a little bit about the municipal side. We're still going through looking at each individual department's request. We haven't come up with recommendations at this point in time. We will. We'll be vectoring to that. Um, and the, the and then Board of Education still has yeah. a process. So tomorrow night will be the um, public hearing for the school budget and the second reading. So tomorrow night is, is a big night for the school budget. Um, and then the following week, Wednesday, will be the town council public hearing on the complete municipal budget. And that will all lead up to um, the vote, as we have talked about, on the, on the school budget. Um, it's scheduled for June 13th, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at Town Hall. And again, we talked a little bit about there will be a ballot question about how to deal with any additional state monies if, 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 they, be, if they come our way. So with that, I think we kind of conclude out. I would like to um, just talk about one thing very quickly. Um, in this deck that will be available, there's some additional information. We've gotten a lot of questions around what is the financial health of Scarborough, and we have attached two, it, it's too much detail to go over tonight for those that are interested. Um, we do have a professional organization that does the bond rating, does the measurement of the financial house of our community. There's really some pretty good information here. We'll, we'll leave them with you. These, these will be available. This talks a little bit about where we are, the pluses and the minuses. This is really helpful. This kind of gives a whole bunch of metrics that you can use to measure how is Scarborough financially doing on a bunch of different sort of metrics. And there's a, there's a great story here, but we'll, we'll just kind of, this material is available. We're not going to go over it tonight, but it's there for folks that are interested. So with that, we will just back up, and I think we're at the point where we turn it back to Kevin for questions. So thank you. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you, Peter and uh, Jody. Um, let's get right to it. Uh, this was a question that came in um, this evening, and we are going to err on asking questions from you in the audience. So feel free to seek out either Kelly or Colette, and they'll get the questions uh, up to me. Uh, the first question I'll direct it towards Tom. Um, the access to town leadership, such as public comment sessions, ad hoc workshops, as well as this very forum, is inadequate for any real substantive exchange of views. The public at large is not allowed to ask questions to be answered directly or follow up 
uh, or allowed follow-up, which was a standard practice under the traditional town hall system of government. When will townspeople have the opportunity for meaningful two-way communications and deliberations on key issues with the town manager and the town council? Well, I'll certainly start. Um, I would then defer to my the elected officials who may well have an opinion as well uh, for reasons that I can only guess, but this community chose in 1969 to change its form of government to the council manager form of government, and as part of that transition and a town charter that helped enable it, um, gave many of those powers to an elected uh, bodies to, to make decisions on your behalf. Having said that, uh, we do try very hard to provide opportunities for input uh, in this day and age, through technology, there are, are many opportunities for people choose to do that, and uh, I would hope they do do that. Um, given the challenges and some of the complexity of this town and the size, frankly, I think the old town meeting form is just uh, virtually impossible to do on an effective basis, given uh, who we are and where we're likely to be in the future. And I, I have to believe, even in 1969, those were the sorts of pressures that uh, gave rise to the, the form of government we have. That doesn't mean that uh, the public's voice can't be heard, isn't heard, and isn't considered in deliberations and, and decisions. Um, certainly we can always strive to do more in terms of uh, finding ways to engage our public and to receive your input, and, and we'll continue to do that, and we're open to suggestions if there's other ways to do it. Um, with that, I would, I guess I'd look to elected officials if they have any further comment in that regard. I think it's important to note that, um, so I'm glad Tom mentioned that we do, starting last year, we do try to answer questions immediately um, if we're able to answer those questions. This past year, um, or the start of this year, we actually f created for the first time a communications committee of the council. And um, so that committee is actually looking at a communications plan. And part of that is that they've already started initiating um, community dialogue sessions in which um, they've held those at town hall. And so we're going to be looking at whether we want to continue those, to expand those, and how we can um, open up that communication uh, pathway. So um, your input in that will be extremely important. Yeah, and I guess, I guess the other thing I'd add is, is that exactly that is one of our goals as a council. We, we, we've heard those comments before. One of our goals this year is a much better communication plan, trying to understand what is the best way to try to reach everybody and get folks engaged. I will, I'd encourage you, Kate St. Clair is the chair of the communication, communications committee. We've had one open forum. It was well attended and people were pretty candid and open and shared. And I think, Chris, you attended and I think I saw Katie Foley here somewhere that was there. Um, we encourage all of you, whoever asked the question, please come. I think Kate has got one scheduled coming up. Um, but it is on our screen. It is a challenge to how can we effectively communicate with all of you. It's important to us and it's one of our goals. So thanks for the question and we'll try to try to respond. Thank you. I'm going to stay with the, uh, the, the town side of things here, at least initially, and then we'll go on to the uh, school side of things. Um, question that came in. Um, on in the email. Uh, for the town's budget, what are the bare minimum items that you are potentially not requesting in terms of safety or maintenance because of the difficult transition to the school's minimal receivership status? What are the near-term implications for the police, fire department, and town administration about what you had to give up in the compromise budget? Well, I'm pleased to say at this juncture, and certainly things can change as we go forward, uh, we should be able to hold our own. Uh, the sorts of things that we, you say, gave up are advancements of certain positions. In particular, there are four uh, full-time firefighter EMT positions that uh, are not part of the proposed budget. Uh, the library is looking at elevating uh, adult services uh, librarian to full-time status. Uh, I don't believe that's going to be uh, able to happen. Uh, and our code office was looking for some part-time assistance for commercial code work given some of the expected commercial development in the next year. Uh, we expect there'll be some challenges in meeting that demand. So those are the sorts of things that I'll say we're, we're, we're going to have to do without and we understand why. Uh, this is not the time to advance those sorts of new initiatives. I think they all 
can stand on their own and can be justified and have their own merit. But given the circumstances, I fully appreciate that this is not the year to advance those sorts of things. So having said that, we're able to maintain essentially all, at this point, all current levels of service uh, that folks have come to enjoy and expect. Uh, one other question before we go over to the school department. Um, the impact of valuation increases. Every year, the town's overall property valuation increases significantly as new homes and businesses are built and added to the tax rolls. These additions of property values generate an amount of automatic increase in tax revenue without having to increase the property tax rate. It appears that the mid-range estimate of new property valuation coming online in fiscal 2018 is about $50 million. How much additional tax revenue does that new property generate, and where does that additional revenue show up in the budget? Kevin, you're pulling a fast one. You're switching things up so that I can't find my, uh, my answers. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a fair estimate, and for conversation uh, points, we can use 50 million. I think it's probably a 10-year average is closer to 38 million, to be accurate. But for, for that purpose, um, Scarborough has enjoyed uh, fairly consistent, fairly aggressive growth, certainly by main standards, comparatively. Uh, ours is some of the highest growth by value and by any other measure uh, you could come up with, nearly. Um, that has afforded us some great things over the decades to be able to expand our services to meet those demands of the, the new residents that come in. Uh, and without that, we would be having perhaps a, a far different discussion. Our, our mill rate would likely be in a far different place. Um, so that does, that, that year over year annual growth and valuation does afford us to do more um, every year. And, and that's, that's certainly something that we've, we've tried to be, be mindful of and that's helped kept our tax rate in check. Uh, keep in mind, though, with these new houses and new residents, the, the demand of service, there is a cost associated. So it, it may be somewhat counterintuitive that not, not only are we getting this tax revenue, but there's an offset. We, we're, we're putting out expense to provide service to these folks. And so uh, it, it, it seems fairly simple at first glance that uh, we should be able to live within our means given this growth. Uh, keep in mind there's uh, an offset, if you will, or a commensurate demand for service that we need to supply, and I think it's probably even more acutely seen on the school side, frankly. Um, in rough numbers, uh, that probably produces something in the order of half a million dollars in extra tax revenue, and, and again, clearly that helps shoulder some of the burden and reduce any impact on the, on the tax rate. Uh, and this has been a point of some, I won't say contention, but discussion every year, certainly during my tenure with the town, and as Council Hayes mentioned, uh, we now have a policy that gives us some guidance as to how to predict what happens, uh, what we expect will happen four or five months from now. It's worth noting that that, uh, that process and that final number of value is beyond any of our control. That's the completely and solely the domain of the town tax assessor. And it should be that way. It's, it's important that it is um, that sole responsibility above any administrative or political influence it is, should be a pure and, and uh, pure process uh, unto itself. And so that's one of the conundrums of budgets. We're, here we are, here you will be asked in a month or so to vote on a budget, but we don't know all the information. And frankly, there's no way for us to know that. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing challenge. We do our best to estimate. And I think the policy that's in place uh, does a good job of kind of providing those bookends of where we're likely to end up. Um, Thank you for the question. Okay. Here's a question that came in um, from our audience uh, and uh, is pretty close to a, to a budget development question uh, that was asked previously, but I'll ask the one that came in uh, tonight. Um, <clears throat> we have heard a lot about the $1.4 million reduction in state education aid, but doesn't the use of $2.1 million of fund balance uh, prior year surpluses uh, more than make up for this. So we've heard a lot about the $1.4 million reduction in state education aid, but doesn't the use of the $2.1 million of fund balance more than make up for this? So I'll start by answering that and then of course ask Kate to join in. Um, 
We are scheduling to use 2.1 million in our fund balance to offset that loss in state subsidy, but we also last year used 1.5 million, almost 1.6 million in, um, in excess uh, revenues from the Wentworth project. So we really have a larger gap to fill than just that 1.4 million that we're experiencing through the loss in state subsidy. Um, thank you very much, Julie. Um, a general budget development question uh, to the uh, school department. Uh, charter requirements for the budget format. The town charter provides very specific requirements of the format of the budget in order to allow for meaningful analysis of it. One of these requirements is that the budget must have a column that shows the projected actual expenditures for each expense category for the current year. While the municipal budget complies with this requirement, the school budget does not follow the charter requirement. Why doesn't the school budget follow the charter mandated format? Are there plans to provide the budget in the required format in the future? So the short answer to that question is yes. We plan to provide the school department budget in this format. We are currently um, in the process, Kate and I have been working collaboratively to develop a system that will allow us to include this information um, in our FY19 budget document and beyond that. Um, but what, what I think is, is important to understand is that generating an accurate projected current year spending for the school department is, um, it's a very complex and volatile task. And this is really due to the continually changing needs of our staff in terms of turnover and benefits, but also our student needs when we think about the services and the programs that um, it requires to educate each and every one of our students. So we do appreciate the value of current year projections um, in the budget development process. This is something that we are able to do um, in particular line areas um, really accurately and there's other areas where we just don't have a system in place at this moment to be able to do that accurately. And so um, one of the things that uh, Kate and I are working on, we've already, you know, have some plans in place for the next budget cycle is, you know, what, what can we put in place to at least start getting those numbers out there and then year after year we'll be able to refine exactly how we're calculating and predicting those numbers. Um, and part of that for me is, you know, looking historically and analyzing the way that we um, are spending our budget um, and matching that with our current needs. So yes, we do plan to provide that same level of detail. Thank you. Um, again, questions coming in from our audience. How much has Scarborough lost in revenue from the state shirking their obligations to revenue sharing and 55%? So a little bit of a statement there too, but how much has Scarborough <laughs> lost in revenue from the state? Just on the school side or? On the school side. Okay. So. Um, there was a question that was submitted similar to this that I don't, was citing some different numbers in the budget, so I'll use this opportunity to kind of answer both this question from our audience here and the question that was submitted. Um, so if you are uh, at home or plan to refer back to our budget book in tab two in the summary analysis on page three, this is where um, it, sh it shows some different um, numbers that include both state subsidy for education and the municipal revenue sharing. So I think it's important that we're not confusing those two things. But from um, FY9, 09, to the current proposed um, subsidy productions that we have received from the state, the actual change has been 69.6%, a 69.6% reduction in state subsidy. It's, it was $7 million in fiscal 09, and the current projected amount would be a reduction of 4.9 million, so we're really getting down to the the very bottom of the barrel as far as state subsidy for um, for the school department. I think I, I thought that that question did actually relate to the town revenue sharing as well. So maybe Tom could speak to that. Yeah, I, I, I beg your pardon. I don't have a, an actual dollar amount. I suppose we can calculate that. I think the question also talked about funding education at 55%. The numbers I think my school colleagues just quoted 
uh, didn't even consider funding at 55, and that would take some effort exactly. to calculate that loss. I don't um, think we would um, know that, seeing as education has not yet been funded at 55%. Right. Uh, from a municipal revenue sharing point of view, uh, that's one of the areas that seems to be continually talked about and, and often rated, frankly. Uh, it's supposed to be by law at 5%. Uh, it's a mix of sales and income tax that's delivered back to property, to reduce property tax burden, frankly. It's currently 3%, and I believe the governor's budget continues to have it at 3%. So there's at least nearly half of what the state law requires us to get. Uh, we're not getting. Okay. Um, I'm going to stay with the school department uh, with another question that came in. Um, from the audience, and, and I did want to uh, just ask, is everyone hearing the answers adequately, even you all back? No. I know I've got a, the loudest voice in the world, but I uh, just wanted to make sure that you are able to hear everything in the back of the room. So everyone is? No. no. You are not. What if we're closer? Well, you're in is the front better? of the room. Pull your chairs up. Well, no, lean in and I think shout. we have to lean in. Lean okay, in and well, shout. I, I, just, I, I wasn't hearing them all that well myself, oh, so um, I'm glad that you can all hear now. Um, We're mumbling away up here. So pull those microphones right close to your, uh, as close as you can, folks. Um, this is a question that came in from our audience. It's got wonderful penmanship on this, too. Just a <laughs> great example of cursive writing. <laughs> How's the school district going to communicate better its needs with residents who are not here tonight? So far, only information has been broadly circulated in the April 14th edition of The Leader. Well, communication happens to be a goal of mine and I believe of the school board and probably every organization everywhere. We're always trying to be better communicators. Um, some of the things that we have done are to, um, we actually most recently started a television show inside Scarborough Public Schools that airs on the local channels, but it also is available on our website. And the, the point behind that is to really break down the four walls of our schools um, and invite the community in so they can see the good work that's happening with our students and our staff and our school leaders. Um, so that's one recent effort. Another thing that we have tried to do, um, our school board has a newsletter that they generate quarterly and, or three times a year. Um, and so that, that's a way to get information and you can subscribe um, to their newsletter and their Facebook page. Uh, I'm also on Twitter if you want to follow me. I try to remember to tweet things out, but um, that's still an area of growth for me. We, um, we produce or we uh, have lots of story coverage in The Leader that gets mailed to every single house in Scarborough. So Michael Kelly from The Leader is an excellent supporter of all things Scarborough and does a really nice job of reporting out on essential things that are happening. Um, all, each of our schools also has their own forms of communication that they um, share on our website. So what we're really trying to do is enhance our website so that can be your one-stop shop that can take you to that TV show, that can take you to articles that are published in The Leader or The Forecaster or The Portland Press Herald, um, and also to the schools and so you can see individual things that are happening in the schools. Um, we're also open to ideas and suggestions, so if, we're, if there's something we're not thinking of or you have an idea of how we could do that even better, give me a call and let me know and we'll try to put it in place. Our question uh, went a little further um, saying it's very hard to find information about uh, why spending is in certain areas. And uh, this question came from a retired new resident from out of state. Um, and uh, among the questions that uh, are followed up are $46,000 for coaching stipends, um, athletic stipends at elementary school at Wentworth. Uh, is, that's one of the questions, just kind of wondering what that is for. Sounds like it's for what is that for? What coaching program? 
Sure. So we have um, a plethora of extracurricular programs for our students across the grade levels, um, starting here at Wentworth with, our, with some of our younger students in grades three through five at the middle school and at the high school. Um, we believe and know that students who are engaged in extracurricular activities are more successful, are healthier, are more productive, become more independent um, con contributors to society. And so one of the things that we do offer our students are um, a variety of clubs and athletics. So um, they're not just, we don't just offer sports programs, but we also offer um, tech clubs and um, foreign language clubs in the younger grades and um, all kinds of other things. And so what we have recently um, done is through the collective bargaining agreement process, the, stipend, the coaching stipends have not been updated in or have not been increased in, in multiple bargaining agreements is my understanding. I'm sure Jackie could correct me on that. Um, and so that was one of the things that was part of that collective bargaining agreement was that we would then look at those stipends and we would um, look at making them more competitive for the time commitments that folks are putting into that. So being a coach or um, providing support for students in an after school club is above and beyond the instructional day um, and is, very time, is, is a big time commitment. And we believe that our students deserve and need that opportunity. So it's one way that we're able to provide that service. Can I make just a, a general comment about folks finding line items that they're not sure about? Um, I'm available. My name's Kate Bolton. I'm the business manager. I generally am chained to my desk, so I'm ready to take phone calls from folks. I know it can be really confusing to read the line item. There's 635, I think, GL accounts with our little labels that we, we try to make them make sense to folks, but we're also restricted in the way that we label things by some of the reporting that we have to do to the state and the feds. So if there are line items where you don't know what's in there or you don't understand what the change is, um, we're open to those questions. And you know, if we don't answer specifically what it is that you're looking for here tonight, please feel free to call. I just want to add one thing, too, about um, just the part about the question, somebody who's new to town, how do you get information? Mm -hmm. So the best way to know about the school budget is we have a meeting that lasts anywhere from five to seven hours every year. Um, with the Leadership Council, and it's basically their defense of their thesis, the defense of the budget, category by category, what items, um, you know, where are they right now, and what items are they requesting in the budget going forward. And that's a meeting open to the public, and we advertise it as much as we can through our communication channels, and we hope that people will attend. This year we had one person come. Um, we have space for a lot more, so next year I invite everyone to come. I mean, really, that's where you hear the details. That's where you're going to get the backstory of, for the budget requests or not requests, which we heard from a lot of schools this year, including the middle school. They did have a position request, but they were able to rearrange a bunch of things in some sort of magical personnel way that it's um, nearly, it's almost not an increase at all in the, in the line item. So, that's the best way going forward. Um, if you want to hear the full story of the budget, is come to that meeting. And it's, um, it's held during the day, so I know it's not as convenient for everybody, but it really is a great way to get a picture. And that meeting is online. Um, it's, I don't know if it's still being aired on Channel 3, but um, overnight. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's on the schedule. Maybe not in the best time for you to watch it, but it is online. Um, and so you can, you can watch that and get some of the backstory for this year, and then going forward, um, feel free to attend. Um, one more comment is um, if you're trying to navigate our budget website and you're not a real um, confident user of that type of information, I'm happy to provide some guidance to show you where to go and what to click on to find what it is that you're looking for. We try to put as much material as we can out there in, in written form. Oh, Harry, there I am. Uh, let me start that again. If, if you are having difficulty accessing information online and you'd like to navigate our budget website and you'd like some help with how to find things and where to look things up, 
I'm happy to do that as well. Um, we're, we're trying to publish as much as we can in that one location, as Julie said, so that people can know where to go if they, if they have information they're looking for. But sometimes um, it takes a little bit of effort to, to find it, and we don't want that to be a barrier for folks. And just one other thing I would add on the school department website, um, if you click, if you go under Board of Education and you click on meetings, one of the things that we've tried to do is separate out the meetings. So there's a link, there's the date the meeting happened, there's a link to the agenda so you can see it in its entirety, there's a link to past minutes, there's also um, a video stream if it's available linked right into that one spot and so the fabulous um, day that we spent together with our leadership council and the school board really going into the, the nitty gritty of our budget, there's a link to that presentation as well. So you can see it in multiple forms if you'd rather read minutes, if you'd rather watch, if you'd rather just see the presentations. We're really trying to parse it out so that it's easy for you to navigate and pick and choose what is of interest to you. Okay, thank you. We're going to move over now um, back to the town side of things. And I'm going to uh, move towards uh, employee salaries and benefits. Um, there, there are a number of questions that have come in on that. Um, and I'll, I'll just start with this one. Uh, what, what is the town's cell phone policy for employees? It appears that most employees on the municipal side receive a cell phone stipend budgeted to be approximately $420 per year. Some departments list cell phone stipend. Other departments, such as public works list stipend in their operating budgets. Does the town require a business needs test for the cell phone stipend and does the town have a policy on personal use of the cell phone while at work? Yes, yeah, certainly the town does have a, a policy uh, regarding personal use uh, in, uh, cell phones on, uh, on duty. Uh, we also do provide uh, two options to employees and there is a business case in, in either case there is a business case uh, in either event uh, whether a cell phone is necessary. Uh, one will, uh, in some occasions, uh, will provide a, per, uh, a stipend, if you will, and someone will be using and paying for their own personal phone, but also will be able to use it for business purposes. In other cases, employees elect to have a town-provided cell phone. I assure you, in either case, um, at least this is the way I view it, and I suspect most of my staff does as well, this is not viewed as a benefit. Uh, that's a tether <laughs> to, to your workplace. And uh, in this day and age, uh, a cell phone is not simply a phone, it's a computer on your hip. And uh, I don't think I'm too different than most people. It's typically the last thing you look at before you go to bed and the first thing you look at when you get up in the morning. And so, frankly, the convenience and the essentially the requirement in this day and age of having folks available uh, off hours is, is essential and there's no doubt there are many of my staff that have in fact that requirement and uh, and again I don't view that as a benefit in many respects uh, it's a burden to staff uh, but it's essential and we appreciate that. Um, interestingly some of the challenges this sort of connectivity creates is some of the wage and hour laws. We have folks uh, uh, literally working all hours of the day and night. Um, and so those are some of the challenges, but that's the reality and it's not going to change. Um, I personally approve the business case in every case. Um, and just to put it in perspective, it's about a $20,000 cost to the town to provide either stipends uh, or direct uh, provision of, of cell phones. Thanks, Tom. Um, staying with employee salaries and benefits, the Kaiser Family Foundation 2016 Employer Health Benefits Survey states that employers generally require that workers make a contribution towards the cost of their health insurance premium. On average, the amount is 18% of premium costs for singles and 30% for family coverage. Most plans require cost sharing and the average deductible is 1200 bucks. What is, uh, what is the contribution percentage required of Scarborough non-union employees for single coverage and family coverage? Does Scarborough still fully pay health insurance for singles? Yes, our policy for non-union employees is to pay uh, single person coverage. Uh, employees pay 50% of the cost uh, for the, the difference for a two person or a family coverage. Uh, that's been a longstanding uh, position or tradition in the town uh, rooted in actually uh, personnel ordinance, it's something that can be looked at. 
We continually have these conversations at the negotiating table with our collective bargaining agreements, um, but uh, that's currently the way it, it works in Scarborough. There's certainly other costs associated in terms of co-pays, uh, depending on the type of service you're, the employee is seeking, their in-network in and out-of-network costs. These aren't anything unique to our plan. It's fairly typical. Uh, but the town does provide 100% coverage for single and 50% for uh, coverage beyond that. Um, again, um, staying with this category, most of us, is, most of us have experienced challenging years at employers at different times. This has often led to drastic measures to control costs, such as slashing training and travel budgets. What is the Scarborough policy on training for employees? What amount? was spent for training municipal employees for 2017 and how much is budgeted for 2018? There's no stated policy, but I'll give you my perspective. Uh, you know, we are in the people business. We provide service and the quality of our employees, um, the day they arrive and every day that they're with us uh, is paramount. Uh, there is, I believe, a direct correlation between the quality of our employee and making sure they're properly educated and trained and supported uh, to the level of service that we provide. And so I personally highly value training and think it's an essential part, uh, particularly of the, the type of business that we're in. Uh, across all departments and all employees, uh, in 2017, there was about $121,000 spent uh, to support employee training. And in the 18, 2018 budget proposed, it's about $128,000. Uh, I think some of those numbers are going to change slightly. Um, and maybe aggressively, depending on uh, the final adjustments to the budget, those are areas that we'll likely have to look at if there needs to be further reduction in expense. Uh, it's not something I want to do, but it's certainly an area that we'll um, that we'll have to look at. Tom, how many town employees had actual 2016 W-2 earnings of $100,000 and over, including overtime and other items? Uh, I believe just one, me. Thank you. And, and uh, one last question, and then we'll go back to the school department. Um, how has the public's increased usage of online services, such as rapid renewal, been reflected in lowered costs in employment at Town Hall? Those sorts of online services are used really in two areas uh, where we've had most success is in community services. Uh, Something in the order of 7% of all registrations are done online now, so it's, uh, it's used heavily, and frankly, we couldn't imagine going um, away from that at this point. To a lesser extent, something in the order of 14 or 15% um, for excise and car registration. Folks use that uh, online and rapid renewal services. Uh, those are certainly available, but uh, for some reason, folks don't avail themselves for, for that. Uh, we'd like that. It's, if it's convenient for folks, it's certainly easier for us. And so uh, it, those are essential parts of uh, the business model going forward. Kevin, can I? Okay. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I, I, I just, I just I'm, I'm kind of slow. I'm just catching up with where the, the first question. And the question that really came in about health benefits and cost of employment and other things, and I think it's, it is something that's on the radar screen of the town council actually this year. Under the leadership of the chair, Sean Baymine, there's been a, we're trying to expand the scope of one of the committees that's going to start looking at all of those policies around compensation. Others, healthcare is a huge cost driver. It's already impacted our budget as we talked about earlier. So that's a great question. I think it's, it's, it's something we're committed to kind of take a look at and try to figure out if we're in the right place and where we need to be. It's all part of that ongoing work we talked about doing. We just can't do this at budget season. We're going to have to start addressing some of these things going forward. So it's a great question and, and it, it is on our radar screen. Thank you. Okay, let's move back to the school department. Uh, questions uh, about, uh, really about uh, employee related salaries, collective bargaining. Um, I attended the superintendent's presentation on the analysis of the teacher's three-year contract. At an additional cost of approximately $2 million in 2016 and another 900000 in 2017, there were many references in it to why this contract is good for our teachers. But nowhere did I hear anything about why it is good for our town or our children. 
One of the many, uh, one of the goals was to bring their salaries up to the five highest paid school districts in southern Maine, which they met. What other objectives did the school board have and were they achieved? So the, the work of the negotiations team on the teachers' collective bargaining agreement focused on creating a competitive and salary benefit package to attract and retain high quality teachers. Um, the presentation actually consisted of a theme of why this is good for our community, why it's good for our students, why it's good for our teachers. Um, and so we did use four school districts um, as a comparison, South Portland, Salmouth, Yarmouth, and RSU 21, which is Kennebunk. Um, and the rationale for selecting those school districts was not that they're the highest paid, but that they, um, some of them are our aspirational districts, some of them are our, um, what's the word that we, comparable districts. And so we wanted to have a range that we were using um, and making that comparison. And, and so um, we also looked at what communities were similar to Scarborough in the location, the amenities, the citizen demographics. Um, and this is really a typical strategy that's used when you're assessing labor, local labor markets. So um, while we're lucky to have a pretty low turnover rate um, and have in the last few years from my understanding, one of the things that we were looking at, and, and also my understanding is that this is a, a goal of the school board and the community over time, was to really ensure that our teachers had a competitive contract. Um, and competitive doesn't mean the best, it means that it allows us to attract and retain high quality staff. Um, and so one of the things that, that we're looking at in this, um, and what's best for our students and, and why this contract is good for our students is that we know in education generally there's a shortage of people even going into um, education majors straight out of high school into college. So typically from the 70s right up until like 2016, about 11, 10, 11 percent of all graduates were going into education majors. And of those 10 or 11 percent that were going into education majors, about only 30 percent, 30 percent never even make it into a classroom. And so of those that do make it into a classroom, another 30 percent leave after six or seven years. Um, it's a high demand job. There's lots of misconceptions about what it is to be an educator, particularly today. Um, a lot of people think that it's a cushy job because you are done by three and you get to leave or you have the summers off and you have the holidays off, but that's not really accurate. Um, if you know a teacher, you know that that is not at all how they work or what their level of commitment is. Um, but for me, you know, I can't, coming into the district while, when this, the negotiations were already well underway, I was actually really pleased to see that our teachers were getting um, a, a good contract. And the reason for that is I'm really concerned about the future of education and what the job market is going to look like. And this isn't just for education. I was listening to NPR this morning and they were talking about how to attract more people into like the truck driving industry. Um, you talk to the IT, IT field, you talk to engineers, you talk to medical professionals. We're having a labor shortage. Um, and so education is not alone in that. But going back to who's going into education, 10 or 11 percent since the 70s. In 2016, 4% of all college students going into college were majoring in education. That's the lowest it's been in 45 years. So that's a big number to think about. And when I was um, analyzing our human resources here in Scarborough and looking at um, the percentages of teachers we have that are very experienced and are coming up on retirement in the very near future, 12.5% of our current teachers, our current employees, um, are of age and of years experience where they could retire today. 12.5%. And another 6% will meet the age and the experience requirements within the next five years. When you think about that, knowing that we already have a crisis, basically, um, when it comes to who's going into the field, and then you think about locally here in Maine, there was an article, um, I believe it was in the Portland Press Herald back in September, and it said that 5% um, of current teachers will be eligible for retirement in 2018 here in Maine. So 
I'm not that great at math, probably shouldn't be saying that at a budget forum, but when I start to <laughs> add up those numbers and think about the future of education and the needs of our students, I'm really concerned. And so I think that um, this, set, this contract gets us closer to being competitive. It certainly does not make us the most competitive in, in Cumberland County or in Maine for that matter. Um, so that, I'm not even sure if I'm totally answering all of the question there, but that's why I think that this is what's best for our students, and I do think it really is all about our students. Um, I, I will follow up by saying I'm on the negotiations committee, and I have been since I joined the school board almost six years ago. So this, um, I've negotiated a lot of the contracts in the school department, and the, f the four districts that were comparative districts for us, they're not the highest paid in, in southern Maine. Um, there are some that are complete outliers, like Portland, that we'll never reach. Um, you should also know that as far as our benefits go, we are different than the town side. We have an 80-20 share of the health insurance costs, all insurance costs. And so the district pays 80 and the employee is responsible for 20%. Um, we also have added the provision for staff members if their spouse is eligible for health insurance at their workplace we're not giving them health insurance. That is a huge cost saver that I don't think people are paying attention to. Annually, that's a $300,000 savings that we were able to negotiate into the prior contract. So we've had three years of that. We've almost a million dollars of savings by just carving out that one portion. Um, and when we were negotiating our contract, as is the case always, other districts are also negotiating their contracts. So when we initially get printouts with their salary and benefits, their numbers are also in flux and are increasing. So we're basing it on their three years ago contract and we're still not even to the midpoint of how, how we're paying our teachers. We're not even to the 50% line and all of those districts that were in flux have now settled their contracts and are far in, um, ahead of us. This contract is not out of line with previous teacher contracts. It's very similar to the percent increases before. Um, and what does the town get for well-paid teachers? We get well-educated students. And I don't think we need to apologize for that. That's the whole business that we're in, is to educate students. And if we're not attracting the, the staff that can do the best job, then, then we're not doing the best for our kids. And that's our sworn duty as school board members. Um, and we're all residents in the town, so your mill rate is our mill rate. And that's, that's the bottom line for us and for you. And we are always going to be in the market for the best teachers. And we need to be somewhat competitive in order to attract them. Um, another question that can, comes from our audience tonight. Uh, I keep hearing about the gradual reduction of state funding to our education budget that will be felt for years to come. But yet I am not hearing any discussion of cutting the education budget in light of the state reductions. Only the status quo is being discussed. Where is the realization that the budget must be cut? Scarborough taxpayers cannot continue to afford a status quo or ever increasing budget. So, um as we're talking about the collective bargaining agreement of our teachers and how we have worked over multiple negotiation cycles to keep a competitive contract or to get to a competitive contract, the same would be true for the level of services that we're providing our students. I think we can all look around us um, and if you're listening and if you're watching what's happening um, in terms of this information economy and how quickly things are growing and developing, we have to grow and develop just as fast. Our teachers have to grow and develop just, in, just as fast so that they're able to ensure that our students are getting that level of instruction that they need to be able to go out into the workforce and to go on to college, career, and life and be able to sustain themselves and their families in the future. And so we aren't proposing a reduction in our budget um, because I think then we'll just be in a rougher position three, four years from now trying to say how do we catch up and how do we fill the gaps that we've created by um, maintaining status quo. Because I think the, the one thing we all need to keep in mind is that a, a level service, a status quo school budget actually means that we're cutting the budget. Another question from our audience. 
Scarborough has a representative on the legislature's important appropriations budget committee, Representative Heather Siraki. Can't Representative Siraki do something to make sure the state pays their 55% obligation? Yes. Do you, I, I guess the question would be, if, if no one's answering it, is are we speaking with our state representatives? Uh, is there interaction on a continuing basis? So in, in my short time here in Scarborough, I have been to Augusta twice um, to really advocate for funding for our town and our school department. Um, this is a, a new skill for me that I am still developing, but um, I went up to talk about uh, a proposed bill that would um, provide credit for locally funded school projects that generate debt service, and then I also went to um, testify on the biennium budget that was presented. And so, um, you know, I, I, I feel like we are doing our part in trying to um, have the ear of our legislators and to help them understand um, what our needs are in our community, as I know many of our community members do, and I do think that they are listening, but it's really, uh, it's complex and it's challenging for, for them as well, and is my understanding, um, and the work that they're doing advocating for us at the state level. Thank you. I, I would just offer uh, a final comment. Uh, in addition to the Appropriations Committee, which is a very important part of the budget uh, review and approval process, this budget, I suspect, like some in the in recent past, uh, will need the support of the full legislature. Uh, we may be facing another bit of a standoff with the governor. Um, it, it, it appears as though uh, uh, there's suggestions or actually uh, contrary budgets submitted quite different than the governor's proposed budget. So I think it's not too much of a leap to think uh, that we'll end up at, at a bit of an impasse. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be important for the, the legislature to come together as a group and perhaps withstand a, a, a veto from the governor. And I suspect funding of education will be a cornerstone of that uh, conversation. So it's not just uh, people in key places, it's all of our delegation that I think will be um, needing to to support our needs here. Um, just one, I'm sorry, one other point about that I want to say from the school side is we have a meeting annually with our, our legislators. We invite them to a school board meeting. So they are aware of our positions about school funding and the, and the position that we have been put in as a town with the lack of state funding. Um, is that we have this meeting every year. So they know the fix that we're in in Scarborough and that we would like to see some of our money that we send to Augusta come back to pay for schools. I just wanted to add, so um, I think that you need to look at the, first of all, um, I believe that um, all of our state legislators are open communicators and I hope that every citizen reaches out to them just as they reach out to us um, at the local level. Um, I think that there is um, there's a broader issue, and that is that there is a state attack against local revenue, because um, in addition to educational funding, we're constantly under fire regarding main revenue sharing. Um, and now the legislature is talking about actually taking away excise tax from the local municipalities that supports our road improvements and other services in which they're going to take it and to fund them. So, you know, um, they're picking into our pockets because they can't balance their own budget. Um, and we're using that money to balance this budget. So um, there's just a, a, an incredible shift in burden onto the local taxpayer uh, for, at the state level across the board. Um, so I, I really encourage um, all the citizens to reach out to all of our state representatives, and we have five of them, um, as well as the town council to share that information. Okay. Thank you, and uh, that's, that's good information for everyone in our audience and at home to, uh, to get. That. Communication is where it all starts. Um, <clears throat> even with, this is another one from our audience, uh, even with the improvements in the school budget announced tonight, the taxpayer funding of the schools will increase by 7.8%. This is the increase voters will be asked to approve on June 13th. Does the town council believe voters will approve that level of increase? I haven't done the math, but I suspect the 7.8% is the, the net figure. It's the amount of additional uh, money that will have to be raised to support the educational side of the budget. Yes, that, that is accurate. And we know that there's potentially more work that needs to be done. Um, 
by no means do we think that we are finished with the budget process, so I don't want folks to think that the, the number that you're seeing tonight is your final number. We're committed to working collaboratively to get um, to a, a tax rate that is acceptable, that allows us to provide and maintain the quality of the programming that we currently are able to offer um, and the services that we're able to deliver to our community um, in the most efficient way that we can. Yeah, and, and as was portrayed by, um, by Jody and Peter at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Julie and I have collaborated really to help move the conversation f further. And as I'll just reiterate uh, Julie's point, uh, we expect further work will have to be done. Uh, but we thought it was important to kind of show our work so far. Uh, it still has to go through uh, multiple processes and have uh, proper vetting done. Uh, but we would not offer such a recommendation if we didn't feel it was uh, sustainable for us and, and doesn't cut into services. Uh, but at the same time, we appreciate that we are on a bit of a collision course uh, for, for a vote, and so we need to move the ball forward. So it's offered in that spirit, and we expect that there'll be ongoing conversation. Uh, Tom, I'm going to uh, keep it on the town side. This is a question from our audience. The town charter requires a vote by the public when bonds are over $400,000. Will the required public vote on the $687,000 fueling station be on the June 13th ballot? If not, why not? I can't answer that definitively. Uh, the council will take that matter up next Wednesday at the council meeting. Um, interestingly, on that agenda is two items. Uh, one is a bond order, which that item is included on. The other one is the ballot language for the June 13th ballot. So. I think wisely the council at their last council meeting tabled the ballot language to preserve that as an option. Uh, we continue to talk to the town attorneys uh, about what the, the appropriate path forward is to comply with local charter requirements. We'll be sharing that information with town council and they'll make that decision next Wednesday. So I'm not going to speculate how they may vote. Uh, the charter does provide a number of exclusions that, uh, that allow borrowing above $400,000 that do not require voter approval. And that's part of the analysis that we're going through, and I'll provide that to the council. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm now moving into the debt. A uh, bunch of questions uh, came in on the town debt. Um, the long-range facilities plan. For at least two years now, town and school officials have been telling us about a long-range facilities plan that will lay out municipal and school facility needs over the next 10 to 15 years. We understand those needs could very easily exceed $100 million. We've been told recently that both town and school plans are substantially complete, but the full plan is nowhere to be seen. Our current debt is around $96 million. Each year we add $4, million, $4 to $6 million to that in routine capital equipment and projects, and debt payments currently comprise 13% of total school and town operating expenses. Given the large annual impact of our current debt level and the huge expansion of facilities anticipated in the next 10 years, shouldn't we be considering the impact of those major facility investments now? I'll, I'll initially speak to the long-range facility plan and what its status is. Um, that document was uh, derived at the... I'll speak to the uh, long-range facility plan first, and others can chime in after. The, uh, that plan was developed uh, initially by town staff, and school staff uh, had their own process underway. Uh, the two pieces do need to come together at the end, but that process was really intended not to scare people, but really to recognize what our, what our needs are and to understand them and to find a way to manage them going forward. Um, nearly everything in that plan, at least from the town's perspective, and I I think it's fair to say from the school's perspective, will require voter approval. And so it will have to be thoughtful and very careful as to how those are um, brought forward. But the simple fact is we have capital needs and we'd be fooling ourselves if we didn't think so and, and we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about them. And so that's really the, the premise behind that study. Uh, we are waiting to pull the different pieces together. Uh, we do expect a final element of that will involve uh, a careful analysis of our current debt load, our expected future debt load, and where these sorts of projects might fall into that. Um, the goal of all of that in our kind of a, our historic 
policy with respect to debt management is to keep annual debt service as level and consistent as possible, really to remove uh, peaks and valleys or volatility there. Um, there has been some suggestion about efforts to reduce overall debt, and that's a conversation that's ongoing. I think Councillor Hayes referred to it. That's a, that's a conversation that uh, probably is uh, very well placed with the Joint Finance Committee uh, because it affects us equally. And just to add to that, um, partly what has probably delayed us pulling those two plans together is the fact that we have been, um, and by we I really mean Todd Jepson, our facilities director, has been engaged in a very lengthy process of applying for um, capital funds from the Department of Education in hopes that um, we could possibly meet some of our facility needs through um, through their application rating cycle. That's a, a very hopeful um, process that we're engaged in and it took us about six months to really pull those whole plans together. Again, I'm saying we, but it was really Todd, um, with lots of collaboration. And that we just delivered those plans to um, Augusta on April 14th, I believe. And um, it's an 18-month process for us to learn whether or not we'll make the list um, in any sort of way. The last time that Scarborough applied, I think we were like 72 on the list. Um, and so, and I think 14 of those 72 projects were actually funded. So one of the things that, that we have done is completed four very, very lengthy applications, one for the middle school um, and then one for each of our primary schools. And while we're doing that, we're also, um, I should say, in that rating cycle application process, you're only applying for the needs of your facilities and the, the health and safety issues of your facilities. You're not applying for a solution. Um, so one of the things that we had engaged in through our long-range facility planning was what would really be the return on investment if we were able to, and we started to think about solutions. So if we were able to consolidate our three primary schools, um, and one of the things I could tell you without getting really into the details is that, you know, a consolidated K-2 would save us at least $5 million day one of opening the door a year. Um, and that's from staffing uh, efficiencies, but also just building efficiencies. It's costing us a lot of money to run those um, three little primary schools because they're aging, um, they're not properly insulated, and there's some other capital improvements that are going to be needed to be done in the next few years. So um, it's a really complex process, and we wanted to uh, take advantage of every possible opportunity that may be out there by applying through this rating cycle. So in, within the next 18 months, we'll find out if we make the list in any sort of way, and that'll really help us think um, more accurately about what are our actual capital needs. It also allows us to be held harmless, um, and what that means is that any improvements that we do make from the point of that application um, and, f and, and into the future won't be counted against us in terms of our facility needs. So we don't have to just let our buildings crumble around us or fall apart around us. We can continue to improve them as we need to um, to be as efficient as we can be in our facility usage um, and, it won't, and it won't count against us in terms of where we fall in that um, list of, of funding opportunities. Yeah, and I think I'll jump on and maybe kind of tie a couple of these questions together. I think certainly it's a great question about as we look ahead to what the, you know, we've in discussions with the, with the Finance Committee both prior year and this year, one of the things we're really trying to take, how do we become more strategic in our planning for the town? There was a question about the school budget versus the municipal budget, but what we're, sort of what's behind us is this one town, one budget. We're really trying to get to a place where we can come together as a community and really think about this, what, what do we need to do as a community to invest in whether it's on the municipal side or the school side. I know on the town finance committee we've, we've had this conversation about we really need to get a handle on debt, when debt retires, and when do we think is the right timing to layer some of these investments in that we're talking about. That work absolutely has to get done, should get done, it was a great question. Um, it takes time and effort to do that, so it, but, but it is a priority for us to, to try to start, start down that pathway. Um, so I, th I thought that was just a great, great question, so thank you. If it helps advance the conversation, we're certainly prepared to move forward on the town side of it and just start to add some context to the conversation. We have all the information, we have the financial analysis that's 
uh, just needs to be kind of touched up a bit, and that's something I can certainly talk to the Finance Committee uh, as to whether we want to roll that piece out forward. Uh, I've, uh, we've been hesitant to just wanting to make sure that we appreciated all of our needs, including the mm -hmm. schools. And again, I, I just add that the joint finance, the joint finance committees. We kind of said we wanted to kind of continue our work through the summer to really try to address some of these issues. We've actually had sort of this long-range planning on the joint finance committee meetings agendas. It's just been we just really haven't given it the attention. But that, that's certainly it's a great point. Something we it, it, that's on our screen also. And again, what we're trying to do, and we talked a little bit earlier about the benefits issue. We're really trying to move a lot of the work of the town council from being just focused on a budget and, and sort of you know this year's budget to how do we look ahead and start anticipating things and do more strategic planning. That's really a conversation we're trying to have, and we need to do it together as a community. So, great questions. We're trying to move that direction. We're just not moving as quickly as probably we'd like to, but it's something that that is on our screen. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, got about. Four more questions that, are, that I haven't asked yet that come from you, the audience, tonight. Uh, here's one. Uh, recently, the school board insisted on moving forward with moving school start times. I completed a lengthy online questionnaire regarding the start times. How much did Scarborough taxpayers pay Hanover Research to design the questionnaire, compute, and process the final results? So we have a partnership with Hanover Research, um, and this year we paid them $10,000 for this partnership. And what that allows us to do is to generate as many projects as we need. Um, and so some of the projects, part, they've done three projects for us so far um, in our, since our contract agreement with them that we started back in December. And what the, so the three projects so far have been a third-party analysis, neutral analysis of my super, superintendent's entry plan questionnaire, and I presented that publicly at the school board that allowed us to have, again, neutral eyes looking at the data. Um, and this is an effort to just try to build trust and credibility with our community members, trying to give more metrics, um, collect more feedback, but also do it in a way that is unbiased. Um, so that's one project that they helped us with. They also helped us with uh, generating the survey, three surveys actually for the start time survey, the student survey, the staff survey, and the parent survey. They then analyzed all of that data. We had over 2,500 respondents across those three constituent groups um, and generated the report that was shared then publicly uh, with our entire community. And they're currently working with us to collaboratively develop with our Scarborough Education Association a culture and climate survey that will be used to support our, our next long drink strategic planning session. And as soon as we get that project underway, we already have another project in the pipeline where we're um, utilizing their support and services to do the transportation audit that will help us find efficiencies, hopefully, in our um, current bus routing. So um, having a partnership like this allows us to have a personal contact director or content director who works collaboratively with us, and I probably call him more than um, I should. I think he made the comment that he talks, I'm the first superintendent that he has talked to so much. Um, <laughs> but um, I really want to make sure that we're getting the return on that investment that we've made and that we have projects in the pipeline. Um, in the fall, we're looking forward to our leadership being able to do some program analysis um, or to um, develop some projects that are specific to either their building levels, their phase levels, or um, specific you know, issues that they've been grappling with or questions that they've been having that they just haven't had the, the human resources to be able to solve. And so in addition to having that content director who sort of helps us develop the project pipeline, we also then have access to multiple PhDs who help us analyze that data and then um, communicate it back out in a way that's digestible and meaningful to our community. Um, one other question for the school department. Uh, there's been talk in previous couple of budget discussions about getting seniors involved in the schools. I believe there is now space used at a, as a senior recreation room at Wentworth. It's right down the hall. I saw it tonight before we started. 
Have there been any strides made in including seniors in the kids' school days? So it's a question about the senior recreation programs here at Wentworth and in the school system, and have there been any strides made in including seniors in the kids' schools day, school day programs? We're always looking for community volunteers. I know that in the elementary schools we have some um, volunteer grandparents who come in regularly and work with our youngest students. And um, I know that we also have many volunteers here at Wentworth um, and at the other grade levels. But it's not nearly what we want it to be. And there's lots of conversation around how do we better connect with our seniors and also um, tap into their expertise and their potentials. Um, because I know that we have a lot of really um, highly educated and talented seniors in the community. Um, and actually we're a little sad because our, the senior program that was here in Wentworth recently was moved to the new um, Martins, Martins Point Health facility. So um, we're looking for more seniors to come and coordinate with us. So if you're interested, give me a call and let me know and we'll come up with some ideas. Okay, another question from our audience um, directed more to the town. Uh, if a level services budget is not passed, what services may be cut from town and the schools? I'm not sure how I would uh, answer that. Um, certainly we would be looking at some of the discretionary areas, discretionary areas in the budget and that can be an interesting conversation. What, uh, what I would ter characterize as discretionary essentially are things that aren't required by law and that we must do for the public health and safety of our community. Uh, this community, you should know, is full service in almost every respect. We do a lot for the residents. And so um, what comes with that uh, provision of service is an expectation of that service. And so uh, those are some of the conversations we may have to get into. But uh, we'd be looking at some of the discretionary areas, um, at least those that aren't required by law or through some other requirement. And I would, I would echo what, what Tom is saying. Um, what we have really tried to do with the school department budget to date is really tighten our projections. So we're trying to look at staff turn turnover and breakage um, really closely, which means that you know, we'll have a tighter budget year next year, uh, which means that we'll have less fund balance at the end of the year. And we already do a really good job of, of, of really budgeting quite accurately. Um, in terms of our needs throughout the year. And you know, what, we've, what we really wanted to do was first look at all of those areas um, because beyond, beyond what we've brought to you, what we're recommending I think currently, it then starts to get really emotional for some folks because you are talking about losing services that you've come accustomed to having. Um, and that can look a lot of different ways. And it just really comes down to priorities at that point in terms of what are we willing to go without. Sean, you want yeah, to if I can add, um, so I, I just want to make sure that the uh, community understands the process that if the referendum doesn't pass, um, the, the town council has no authority to determine on the school side what programs should or could be adjusted, cut, transferred, reassigned. That is purely the responsibility of the school board and the school staff. However, I think that over the last two years in particular, we've taken a very collaborative approach to at least talk about the overall dollar amount if we do have to make an adjustment um, and have a shared decision on what portion should be in the town's budget and what portion should be in the school's budget. But it's purely on the school's, the school's responsibility to determine what programs they choose. We have absolutely no say in it. It's, and by the way, that is not only by our own charter um, declaration, but it's also by state law. We are not permitted to make those recommendations. That's why we talk about one budget at the top level and not about programs on the school side. Um, we're coming up on 8.30. Uh, you know, previous, when I, when I came uh, tonight, we had 40 questions that had been submitted online uh, that were really kind of directed towards the town. There were about 29 questions, 29, 30 questions that were directed towards the school department. Um, all these, I've been asking some of the questions, but we've really had quite a few come in from the audience tonight, and I, and I really felt if you showed up here, I should ask you a question. Um, these questions that were submitted previously are going to be posted on the town website and answered both uh, 
the ones directed to the town and to the school department and also the questions that were asked tonight from this bunch um, I'll be giving those to uh, Tom and Julie so they can be answered and also posted. Uh, the, the last question, the only question that I have not asked that was submitted to me is an assessing question um, and it's how successful was the senior tax rebate program? Uh, you know, the numbers who benefited and the amount that was paid out. Extremely successful, so much so uh, we had a, a probably a budgeted only half of what the need was. The good news is we had existing resources through prior action of council to fund, fully fund all eligible uh, applicants. Uh, what you'll see in this year's budget is a total of $130,000 uh, for that program. Last year it was $75,000 just by comparison. Uh, we've had a bit of a spotty experience in this, not due to our interest or commitment or funding at the local level. It's really due to the fact that historically our local program was tied to the state's, uh, used to be called the circuit breaker program. Mm -hmm. uh, so eligibility um, really flowed through that state program. The state totally changed that and now has something called the property tax fairness credit program and it's, uh, the, the benefits have been severely diminished. Uh, so much so our local program is far superior in almost all regards. Uh, so I would characterize it as a rousing success uh, uh, folks that fit the, the criteria for eligibility arguably are our most um, um, in need, if you will. They're longtime residents that meet the income requirements, uh, and those are the folks that I think we ought to be paying most close attention to. Uh, if anything, there are opportunities, and I know uh, Councilor Donovan, who really spearheaded the most recent update to that uh, program, is interested in having a uh, maybe another year's experience and then looking at uh, reviving that or revising it to maybe expand uh, eligibility really to further uh, assist folks in, that fall into that category. Okay. Well, what are our next steps in this budget process? So just to reiterate, uh, um, the town finance committee meetings will take place. Uh, we have another one coming up on May 4th. Um, also on Monday, May 1st, 6 to 8 p.m., um, the school board public hearing, as Jody mentioned at the beginning, um, is tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock in the council chambers, and you will also have a budget vote tomorrow night. Do I have that correct? Um, then the town council public hearing on, on the uh, budget will take place on Wednesday, May 3rd at 7 o'clock, leading to a town council budget vote on Wednesday, May 17th at the 7 o'clock meeting, and then finally the school budget validation vote uh, Tuesday, June 13th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you're uh, from the general public, you are surrounded by town councilors, school board members, town department heads here in the building. I quite honestly feel that just talking to the people that are available here in the room tonight might be the best course of action over this, you know, as we end the evening. I, I could sit here and ask questions that were written out that are available on the website with answers, but uh, it, it would be my feeling to take advantage of the people being here in this room tonight if you have any questions because I'm sure our our elected officials and our town employees would be more than happy to answer any questions or concerns that you may have as citizens and taxpayers. So uh, with that, I can pass it over to you folks for a closing statement, uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, don't feel like you have to rush out of this room tonight just because the Celtics are getting ready to tip off and get five minutes. <laughs> <and eight players. laughs> Like right now. Yeah. Just if I could say one thing for myself, I'm very pleased. Uh, when I left work on Friday afternoon, there were n no responses, no questions offered. Um, and when we came in Monday morning, we had about 70. So something happened over the weekend. Whoever helped energize that, I appreciate it. Uh, what, that, what that has meant for us is uh, doing some extra work to, to mm -hmm. sift through those to make sure we're prepared for tonight. And as I think back to some of my responses tonight, I didn't do that justice. So uh, I'm, I was very pleased with kind of the depth and substance and the kind of forward thinking nature of almost all of these questions. Um, what that requires for us is fairly depth, in-depth responses back. And so 
do take the time. We will take the time to answer them completely in depth online. Uh, it will be there for your review, and I encourage you to go there. Just, uh, um, and I'm sure my colleagues at the school will do the same. Absolutely. And thank you for coming out on a rainy night. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.